What follows is a conversation with uh, Russell Anderson, the founder and president of Clearwater Vision. And I don't ever do this, but I want to invite you today to truly sit back, take the time to watch the full conversation. This quite possibly is one of the most important and deep conversations I've ever had in my life. I believe it can change the trajectory um, not of humanity, but the trajectory of your thought process, of your feeling process, and potentially your life, to dive into what Russell is sharing with all of us. Uh, you will be deeply moved, informed, and inspired, I can promise you that. So please, do me a favor, take your time to watch this, to go deeper into this, and to share this with your friends and family. This is how important this is. Now, without further ado, please enjoy this wonderful conversation with Russell Anderson. Hey, Inspired Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers, it's John Nolan here, and it's my great honor and privilege today to welcome a very special guest and um, hopefully a new friend, and that's what it feels like, to the Inspired channel for an inspired conversation. Um, please welcome with me Russell Anderson, the president of Clearwater Vision. Thank you so much for coming on today, Russell. Well, thank you, Sean, and it's... Um... It's a privilege after talking to you, even just a short amount of time, it's, it uh, touches my heart. Um, I did, uh, you know, the, the email things with everybody. And of course, they explain some of the people that, that are part of different organizations. They urged me to talk to you. And I am very impressed with what they want me to do because we've been working on this project for 26 years. And yet there had been little response, and, and, you know, throughout the years. In fact, we probably gave up several times, you know, trying to explain that water comes from within the earth and not, it doesn't originate from the atmosphere. So by doing that, you know, it's sort of alienated ourselves and so on. But now we're, we're really coming into view. And I wanted to just say a little bit about this because it's not about what we learn. It's about what we experience. In, in, in a divine way, our experiences are, are magnified. And just, you know, we all have that venue inside of us to make that happen. And I'm so happy that people are finally responding, regardless of the polarization that's going on. The polarization is teaching us the proper way to go. And we have to look at it as positive and not negative. And it's important that we all sit and talk in the round table and make these things happen. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more, whether that's around a table, around a fire, and um, also remembering that there is much, much more that unites us that, that could then what could possibly divide us. You right. said you said something in our um, brief conversation before we started uh, recording here and that I might not have heard very often in that particular way. Over the years, we have learned a lot about water, the importance for all life, the importance of water for all life. We have learned that water is a tremendous vehicle for information in ways that we couldn't have imagined before. But you said it so beautifully in three words. Water is consciousness. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, um, I, really, I have to go back to my meeting with Dr. Emoto from Japan. I, I heard a lot of people hear about them. And, I, you know, the experiences that I had with him, you know, just a short amount of time just before he died, he was very close to a guy named um, um, Dr. Hugh Brown. And of course, I was the guy who ran the machine from city to city in 96. So he was very famous in a sense, Hugh, Hugh Brown, both of them were famous at a very short amount of time. And then of course, I got to meet both of them. And 
Emoto said, you know, to me, he said, you actually met this man? You know, I said, yeah. I said, I don't know how, but I, I ran his machine in the 36 city tour. Back in 1996, they even made a movie about him and, and yet very few people could respond. And the importance of just these experiences teach us how water actually works through their own experiences and everybody should understand this. But you, uh, the, that what, what it is, the consciousness in water is actually the family structure. You know, the, the trinity that we talk about H2O and the extra H and H2O is basically the spiritual part of it. And if we pollute it, if we destroy it, if we, we, we destroy our own consciousness. And that's why we're searching for ways of bringing that water up like Moses did. Just the whole spirit of life is our, it comes from within our own self. And water is consciousness. And if we decide to pollute it, to create an economy uh, out of polluting water, we're destroying our own, our own consciousness. So we're having an example of that, you know, we call it mental illness, you know, or even, even politics is mental illness. You know, if we actually think about it, we go left or right without staying in the center, which was where the center of the earth is. And this is what the Native Americans understood. And, you know, we, we didn't right away. We're, it's taken us years to understand who we are because we come from conquering nations, nations that want to control other nations. And it's not good, you know, but, but being not good is actually good because we can realize, you know, the, the depth of the need of our own changes in the world. Which is what you touched on before when you said that both evil and good are important and the duality that we're experiencing now actually allows us to come to realizations much quicker, much faster, because both things coexist so beautiful, well, not beautifully, but so visually, so feelably next to each other. And it's it's the, the power of contrast also to realize what actually feeds me, what allows me to thrive spiritually, physically in all areas. So um, the, the acceptance of duality is probably the, the key moment to spiritual evolution and to the constant betterment. Um, you said something, and, and I, I, we, we, we do want to learn more about water, but you said something uh, earlier in our conversation where you said, we as, as Europeans, um, we came to this land, we came to Turtle Island, to North America, to learn. We came to learn um, and have forgotten it somewhere on the way here or have forgotten it when we landed. Um, what, what did we come to learn? Well, as the Native Americans, and you know, we, I had with, with uh, Brown Ego several conversations many years ago. And in those conversations, we talked about what, what the Europeans came here to find out. And the Uruguay Indians explained to them that, you know, we're, we're all equal. And of course, the, the Iroquois were, you know, were put, set in a situation where there were many springs in the grounds and so on. So they understood that consciousness was already equality. So we're, we're learning that we're equal. We're not apart. We're not separated. We're, equality is the main issue and the, why the Declaration of Independence was named by the, the Europeans to say, hey, we need to fight for our freedom. We need to uh, separate ourselves from those conquering nations. And we're, we're part of that. And there are few of us in, the, in this country that don't, don't sit there and compete against each other, but we look to ourselves and we look to those people who had taught us from the beginning that we're equal. And that's what's happening on the West Coast here, too. That equality, I, I know that, you know, if we study the geography and what's in our underneath the ground and what's happening to the springs and so on, for all these years, we're losing those springs. 
We don't know where they came from, you know, because we don't know where they came from. We can't identify them. But now we're learning because we studied the, the ring of fire for a long time for, you know, 20 some years, which isn't a long time. And we studied how they traveled from south to north, you know, through many millions of years. And we have this one place we we want to bring the water up back to to this area so that we can spread this consciousness. It's it's really the the oldest lake in America. And people don't understand what that would mean. But if that's the truth, then we need to explore that. We need to see that there is a traveling of these volcanoes that we don't see anymore that come to a place we call Clear Lake in California. And then it goes back into the ocean. This ring of fire goes back into the ocean. The things that we can learn from these natives who lived there for 12,000 years, I mean, uh, is remarkable. And they live on a mercury mine, believe it or not, you know, so there's a positive and negative charge there that we have to bring. And of course, with that, I decided to go to India and, um, and Nepal to learn from the alchemist, you know, many years ago. These are divine experiences that we all can have, you know, if we really want to grow and take what we've learned and, from others and then expand it. So if the Dalai Lama said that mercury will be an, a neurological medicine in the future, we have to find out why and how that would happen. And so we're learning that through this place we call the last of the oldest seeable volcanoes in, in California here. And there's a mercury mine there, and we have to expose the information to the people to see what's going on and and how we can shift and change it and so on through our own consciousness the western approach to learning in science has been now for um centuries that basically in order to understand life we have to first take it kill it then dissect it and then believe we can learn from you know having killed it how it lived and uh, versus the the uh, understanding of the learning process of a lot of, uh, or the most indigenous peoples that I have ever studied is the observation, the observation and the experience of life, actually putting yourself fully in a spiritual and a physical uh, state of experience of this. So um, when I listen to your words, th this is what I'm gathering is, what comes um, what comes from this spiritual observation of things. And why I say this is because previously we talked about how the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom is all around us. It doesn't actually have to be gathered. It doesn't actually have to be uh, dug up somewhere. It's our tuning into this knowledge, right? With our hearts and our spirits that allows us to see it when we are ready for it. And so when you when did you discover in your life this readiness or the quest or the, the 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 need for this tuning in well you know it's been with all of us and i have to tell you that we are all been following this same you know the same image you know in a sense but if you want me to describe i i met a, a mentor you know um who told me he said, you must continue what you're doing. And I looked at him and I said, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and he just said, yes, you do. <laughs> I mean, this, this whole process is like, you know, well, this guy knows something about me that I don't know, you know? And why does he know that? You know, well, he was a very spiritual man. He was a, a devotee of Yogananda since 1933, you know, just before everybody... I knew he, he passed in 03 and I just wondered why it is that I keep doing what I'm doing and I understand it more directly now, you know, that it's, it is what they feel that is very important. And these we're being guided and we're being by um, very, and we're being directed in a certain way that, you know, is divine and, we're um, 
protected. All of us are really protected. All we have to do is call on them. It doesn't really matter who they are and what you believe in, you know, but it is a feeling that our ancestors, and this is what the Native Americans did, our ancestors are teaching these things to, to us. And I'm, I'm not, for say, a religious person. I am a very deep spiritual person, and I believe that God or universe or Jesus, all of these, all of these saints and sages, you know, of of the land have have been teaching us the reason why we're here on this planet. I feel the same way, and I feel that what we're what we're seeking in this is truly the the consciousness of it. And I think the the language has been one part of it. And then, of course, um, deliberate manipulation has maybe turned this into a physical story. There needs to be a return of a physical person uh, to save us all. When in, when in my heart, I believe it's the return of a consciousness. It's the, yeah. the re, um, rediscovery of this consciousness. I, I would like to... Um, ask you a question about the two words that actually triggered this whole chain of events that now allowed us to have this conversation. And the two words were primary water. And I've never heard those two words put together until, um, until a wonderful lady, Annie reached out to us and, or Anne reached out to us and said, um, I've been watching, you know, your channel. I love what you, what you guys do. And I think this is something that your audience would really love. And when she put primary water out there and, and allowed us to have a first glimpse into greater knowledge around it, it was fascinating. Um, can you introduce our audience to what primary water means and how our perception of where water truly comes from um, is, is incomplete right now? Yeah, you know, that's, you know, Annie's such a sweetheart. She calls me all the time and she tells me about you guys. And I'm going, you know, really, really, you know, there's somebody going to respond, really, you know, because we've been doing this for many years. And primary water is is within every planet, you know. And, and as soon as you go to the, the, the poles of a planet, you begin to see that this primary water exists. And it's very healthy and it's very direct in, in, we call it in a sense, light water. You know, some people call it light water. Um, um, deuterium is the opposite, you know, but if we reduce that down to a reduced amount of, you know, deuterium, then we begin to see that there's new life, you know, for us and so on. And there's also, I mean, we can get into the whole energy because primary water is everything that we started with. And of course, if we pollute that water, even the atmospheric water, there are two, two uh, as it says in the Bible, two firmaments. There are two upper and lower. And the lower is basically within us and, and you know, within the earth. And so it is, is with our, ourselves. We create primary water by just drinking atmospheric water in a sense. And of course it comes through us and so on. And same with the earth. There's no difference between we and the earth, but of course we, we decided to pollute it. I mean, I, I can say you can put blame games on people and tell them they shouldn't have done that and so on, but it's not the case. We have the, we have the power to understand and by understanding the earth will grow and the earth will is yearning for that growth. And of course we got tornadoes, you know, which is a vortex and same as within the earth. We've got hurricanes and all of these things that are basically having to clean up the surface of the earth because we haven't done that as custodians. So primary water is, is the water within the earth and it has more complexity. Emoto came to Clear Lake and in that, you know, I sent you guys some documents and so on if you, you do use it some other time. But he came to Clear Lake and he was amazed. He said that the, 
he said the water structure is the most complex he's ever seen. And he's traveled all over the world to see these things. And, you know, so I brought him, you know, he, I picked him up at the airport and we, we did some, um, you know, unification things about where we've been. And so it's just similar to what we're talking about now. And, and he was very amazed that I could say that, well, this water, the reason why it's so complex is because it's the last of the oldest sea of old volcanoes and there's still water coming up from below the mantle, you know, in that area. So we have all of those documents to show people, but he could understand it, you know, um, that, you know, because I met up with Hugh Brown was his, which was his idol, you know, mm -hmm. many years ago, we put the dots together to say, hey, this must be the reason because we're closer to the, you know, the, the center of the earth at one point on the land, which is a, a place called Clear Lake in California. Well, Clear Lake right now is polluted is polluted to the largest extent and still the the water there is still as complex. So we're trying to save the water, but we're mostly trying to save the natives, you know, to bring back the wisdom because it's their, it's their lake. It's, they know, their ancestors know many thousands of years ago, and yet they can't explain it now. So, um, so anyway, you know, we have a situation where we can look to see the, the reason why they're incapable of, of understanding that. And there are a few people that understand to a certain extent and to, to revise the wisdom of our Native Americans is extremely important right now. Which is um, one of our deepest intentions and one of our greatest desires in our heart to help in that process. Um, and that's why, you know, as much as we can, first of all, it is our own learning and then um, bringing this knowledge and wisdom through these means that we have. So this is a, a deep, deep desire that goes way beyond uh, just a regular ego intention. It's much, much deeper. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I know and I've heard and I've read that you have um, the organization has brought this knowledge to various authorities, various projects about primary water and how, how it might help in solving some of the um, problems with droughts and whatnot. But um, as far as I know, the reactions weren't very positive or, or you know, very open hearted, open handed. Um, can you can you elaborate on that a little bit and why you think that is? Great question. You know, thank you for asking it. You know, not too many people do because most people will reject the idea that water originates within the earth. Most people will do that except for the natives. And of course, they're just on the verge of, you know, overcoming their anger t t towards the white people who polluted it, you know. And so we're sitting in a situation where we can now open the door to uh, a solutions that will allow this to happen. And we have technologies, you know, that will, what we're calling is prime the pump. Priming the pump means we can structure the water just enough and we can sit in prayer, which is the strongest thing that we can do because we can understand now why Emoto asked us to pray next to these places. These, these are the things that we, if we ask the right questions, we, we can answer them through the, the, you know, how the earth actually works. So to tell somebody that water originates within the earth is a chore. It's really not easy to tell them that when they've been thinking that water only comes from the sky. And really they both need each other, both firmaments need each other. Mm -hmm. So we're learning that we can use these vortex technologies now, you know, because we're learning through our hurricanes and volcanoes that that's the way the earth works. We can structure the water just enough where we can beckon that water up. And that's where we're, we're working on those sciences right now. 
um, we we have a tribe down in in you know down in Southern California that we're only just you know, helping them just enough to realize how important they are. But that's not going to be enough. We, we have to go further in, into our, our earth so that we can, you know, pray for it. And we can ask the right questions. And by knowing something that's very valuable, we, we can make those moves. Our governments aren't going to do that. Politics won't really work. We've tried all of those things, and I guess that was a good thing. That was a good thing that we learned that it's not the way it's going to happen. But I've gotten letters from politicians and so on that said, well, I'm thank you, thankful that you are doing what you're doing. And that's as far as they can go, because they're, they have their own agendas that are taking them away in a, in a, in a different way. I'm, I'm seeing that. Eventually, they will be able to see how important that the knowledge of the water that comes from within the earth is extremely important for the surface water that exists today. And, and I want to make one thing clear um, that we're not talking about the groundwater. That is, we're, we're talking about deep, deep, as you said, um, several, and I, I wouldn't even know how many miles we're talking here uh, within the the earth, but is there a, um, and you said this, the knowledge is, is currently not fully accessible, not even to um, the natives fully because of the interruption um, in over the past hundreds of years, the interruption of the oral traditions of the passing on from generation to generation because of the interference. But is there a um, belief or a theory as to how this water actually originates? Um, what the initial process was or if it is the prime creation simply that that is uh that is at work here well there are different theories and so on and dr hugh brown had to you know that uh, water is, is the sun he called it water is the sun hydrogen and oxygen mixed together which which creates the water and that's where god put his spirit upon the water i have different scientists that are, you know, at believe different ways of it, but it's really the same, you know, that there's a gas that comes from that, you know, that interaction between hydrogen and oxygen. And that happens within our planet. That's where the, why it's so hot inside the planet and so on. That's where it comes out. And there's to some, some scientists, they say there's huge, huge, uh, the res re reserves of water below the mantle. And that's probably true. But other scientists will say, like Dr. Hugh Brown, it, it's converted in a sense through space and it travels through our poles. And then basically that gas connects within the surface and that's how it's created. I, I met up with uh, pa Paul Powers and uh, we spent a long time who uh, if you go into looking to, to where his mentors were, and you even go back to the 1800s, the discovery of primary water was uh, discovered by a guy named Nordenskjöld, and he, he tried to submit all that information to uh, the, the public and so on back then, and even one um, a laureate, you know, the... Um, no, no laureates, you know, and so on. But he went to discover at the poles, and that was his science that he died at the poles and so on. So nobody picked that up until a guy named Stephen Reese came by. And Stephen Reese, uh, you know, um, he discovered primary water as well. And he came to America, and believe it or not, he came to the east or the west coast here because he knew that drilling those wells there, we, he could find it much more easier because that's part of the ring of fire. So we address this whole thing, you know, with, with what I've learned from the teachings of Yogananda, because he came to the West Coast, you know, mostly LA, because he knew there were saints and sages there for millions of years in the past. That connection basically made him name Luther Burbank 
you know, which was a big surprise to his followers. Luther Burbank was was the number one person in his, uh, we named the, the book after him, you know, uh, Autobiography of Yogi, which became very famous for a lot of people back in the 60s. So what we've learned from Luther Burbank is that he lived, you know, right along that whole area, you know, where the last of the oldest seeable volcanoes were, which is Clear Lake or, or, or Kanaktai. We call it Kanaktai Mountain. For three three million years ago, it, it was this it's this eruption that happened that that taught us that water was more structured in these areas, and we we could meet it halfway in a sense by studying that. So California, in a sense, became more of a a stronghold, you know, uh, to a lot of people in the rest of the world, you know, many years ago. But we found that the bioaccumulation of, of mercury was, was the opposite to that. And that started creating uh, other problems with compensate for that. It brought in more heavy metals and understanding of, of, of the reasoning that the heavy metals needed to be neutralized. And that's where we got into the alchemy process and thinking that you know that the Dalai Lama is right in the future we'll be able to neutralize those toxins and we'll be able to bring in a, a, a natural healing process to mercury rather than the opposite. Well it has, it has often been said in many different ways that the difference between something being highly beneficial or being destructive is not in the substance itself. It's in the consciousness that operates with the substance. Absolutely, yes. And so, so we're learning that. And, and so by learning that, we can actually uh, expose the, this these things we call good and bad and what actually we learn through, you know, without chaos, there's no creativity. And so we, we can learn that. And, you know, our computer industry is, you, yes and no, you know, bits and bats, whatever it is, you know, it's, it's just a duality. There's a third entity to that. And that's why it's important for us to understand why, why a duality is not the end of the road. You know, this is what God said, you know, this is, he said, you know, I, I put the, you know, I put it in the water. Consciousness is water. I mean, Katy Perry saying, you know, in California, there must be something in the water. It's only because we're a little bit closer to the magma of the earth and something happened that we can change. But it's been under attack for uh, 40, 50 years, you know, because of this bioaccumulation of what happened during the, um, the gold rush. We did, we did the goal. We made the wrong decision, you know, and I talked to a person just the other day. He says, you need to invest in gold. I says, well, well, can you eat gold? Can you eat it? You know, because we need, we need to eat something, you know, and without water, we don't have an, an economy at all. It doesn't matter if it's gold or silver, or whatever you want to call it. it. It's all is created by water itself. And primary water will help us understand that. We have a, we've taken all the water out of the aquifers out of the Central Valley here. It's a perfect example of the reason why we're having these fires. You know, you take, you lose a humidity, you know, in, in the air and you're just going to burn up. You know, do we teach that? We're not teaching it because there's an agenda that somebody else has that don't want to don't want to hear that. We can easily talk to those people with the agenda and say, "Hey, we we can convert this over to a, a greater economy because there's more abundance. There's so much more abundance in learning where water comes from. Just to honor, just to honor the water, you know, and to cry for it." is is so important it truly is and it moves my heart listening um to the truth and the wisdom of this and one thing that kept coming up during this conversation was the um 
the uniqueness of California, the uniqueness of why so many the spiritual people were so drawn to that area like Yogananda was. And he came and, and the center of his teachings in North America and probably in the Western world is in and was in California, which also explains when we look at duality and what, how we talked about it, why the darkness moved in so heavily into California and why we now see this extreme polarity and, and maybe more than anywhere else uh, on this, uh, on Turtle Island. Right. And Russell, if you, we talked about this earlier briefly, we talked about the seventh generation. and We have talked about this quite often on our channel, uh, what that means, uh, what the, uh, the natives mean by uh, consider the seventh generation in every decision you make, which doesn't mean like we look at it, seven generations, maybe 20 years per generation. They look at seven full generations. So th this could be, you know, uh, even in today's terms, as much as 500, 600 years. When you look into the future with your heart, with your spirit, and um, if this knowledge, if this wisdom reaches the people, like it is your deep desire and desire of many people that it does, how do you see the future for the seventh generation? What what could change in those 500 years? How could this, this whole earth be different if this knowledge is internalized and applied? Well, that's what a guy named Sri Ateswar, you know, which is very close to Yogananda, had to, you know, asked him to come to California. He was kind of like the guy that I knew, you know, who, who told me, he, he said, you must continue what you're doing, you know? He didn't know, you know, he said, well, I'll just go and, you know, he's told me to go there. I'll go there, you know, and he noticed there was a spirituality to it. So the seventh generation is basically what we're learning. You know, we're going in a sense backwards enough where we realize how important our ancestors were, you know, and as soon as that happens, it opens up. And he talked about Dwapar Yuga and, you know, the shift between, you know, one age to the next age. And, and basically it wouldn't be easy, you know, to, to go through that, but it <laughs> is to go through your heart, you know, and those are the things that you're here for. Those are the things that you're here for. There's nothing more that you, you can do. Everything else would be an illusion. You know, it's, following your heart is so valuable. And even my mentor, he told me, he said, this is just, this is just a stage, you know, it's a stage for you. And you're, you know, you, you're realizing how much this is an illusion. And it's Samadhi is a very valuable information to know that we're here to, to love one another rather than hurt or kill one another. I mean, if this is insanity and we have to recognize it as insanity if we continue to pollute this earth. Everybody wants to be a Democrat or a Republican or something. They don't know who they really are because they want to identify to someone who's alive, you know, who says he's alive or something. And even Jesus said, we are gods. We are we are inside of us. You are, you know, and we had a hard time believing that. And now we can reach a point where we know that our, our next generations will understand it, even if they don't understand now. I mean, a little kid, I remember talking to these, these younger kids and so on, and they understood you know, just by looking at a globe that, that fit these continents once fit together. We can't, you know, as you get older and older, you, you don't remember that. It just, it just isn't part of your life because you were taught that water only came from the sky. And so we need to learn that, that one thing, and that one thing will touch our hearts. I know that, but I don't know if, you know, my, the people around me don't. And I often just say, you know, beam me up, Scotty, you know, get me out of this place, you know, and, and, you know, oftentimes my friends die and I don't, I'm envious of them, you know, but I, I'm here for a reason. I'm just here, you know, I, 
And if someone wants to know about water, then I will teach them what I know. But there's much more. There are scientists up there, out there that come to me and say, you're absolutely right. And this is what I want to teach you more. OK, I, I, I love that, you know, and they're very important. Um, but we have to realize that we can't keep brainwashing people thinking that we can pollute the earth and create an economy out of it. It's not possible anymore. Well, you said so beautifully just a few moments ago, you said we, we cannot continue to pollute the earth, pollute, pollute the water. And, and when I listen to you, it is clear to me that it, ha it always begins with the pollution of our minds, hearts, and souls. So how do we clean that up and how do we go into, into states? Because once, once this is cleaned up, there's no intention, no, no, no feeling, thinking being would ever have the intention to pollute the mother, to pollute the great mother, because it's not within us. So the cleanup process within is what we have learned, the, the foundation of it all. For us, it was meditation and is meditation for us it is connection with nature connection with the divine what would be your advice and with your life experience with your own journey what would be your advice for people to begin the cleanup process or intensify it or purify it or make it better well you mentioned meditation and yes it's very true my mentor taught me that some years ago but more than that um you know, it's just your breath. It's so easy to figure out that, you know, I mean, you breathe, you breathe in and then you breathe out. But that that breath is so very valuable, not just the breath that you breathe in. You think that that's the most important, but it's the breath that you breathe out that gives off to the, the rest of the world, you know, and so on. We're the center of that. And if we can't re recognize how important the breath is, then we're never going to be able to breathe or to believe in ourselves enough to recognize that the earth has the same situation where it breathes and so on. I, uh, I don't know how I can explain that, but I, I do know people who, who are mediums who can talk to people uh, on the other side and, so I got an opportunity to ask him, I said, can you connect to Stephen Hawking? And of course, you know, he's the most smartest man in the world, and but he's in spirit world now, right? Now, how am I supposed to tell that to people? I, you know, that, that's the crazy thing. They're going to put me in an institution to say I talked to Stephen Hawking, you know, after. He, but I believe that that was true. We, we talked about this very, very, I said, I asked him a specific question, you know, that the medium didn't know or anything. And I said, do you think that the black hole exists within the earth? And uh, he, he, he had to think, you know, for a while. And he said, yes, and thank you for that information. I said, what, what information? I, you know, I'm just asking you a question. Yes, I see now that it is a black hole inside the earth, you know, it, it's alive, you know, and he always didn't believe in God. He said, you know, but but that may, allows me to believe in God because it's within the earth. I've been there for all those years. What a beautiful story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I go, how am I supposed to tell it to people? I mean, I don't know. You know, I'm. I'm just Mr. Magoo walking around here. You know, I don't know how you, you know, this little man who basically is learning all these things through spirit and not through education. And, you know, because education oftentimes just makes us avoid any kind of experience. Well, in, in our perception and in our own journey, one thing has become abundantly clear when you say you connect behind the veil or you connect with the other side, you receive um, but truly, what is wisdom? What is knowledge? What are thoughts? It's energy. It's consciousness. That doesn't go away. You know, energy doesn't just disappear. It's a matter of can we tune into that? Can we? So to me, this is much saner, much clearer, much more sensible than the approaches we have in our boxed in 
um, worldly reality, if you will, how we obtain knowledge and wisdom, which is like I said, it's the opposite of how the creative process works. It's where we, we go into the destruction first to try to understand the creation. And it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to me. So what you have just described is a much more sensible approach. And I think it's the approach of the indigenous peoples. And I think they go on vision quests. They, um, they're, they're most connected members are being sent out if it's needed to receive prophecy, to receive vision. This is the process they go through when they are in need of greater answers or information, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think you keyed on that because there was, you know, they, they seem to have their first two, you know, their two um, chakras in order, you know, uh, there's, you know, it's, I worked with a, a a guy. I don't know if you've heard of Sonic Bloom. You no. know that it's a vibration of of what what we're calling is the sound of of the first two um, of the first two um, chakras in the body, and they're they're very connected to the earth and so on. So if you don't don't experience that those first two you know in a more perfect way that they you know they it becomes more evident that we need to work on a third chakra it's a do re me you know which me is uh, is either our ego or we realize that we're all one and so their recognition of oneness is far greater because of their connection to the earth the mother earth which we kind of, you know, think, yeah, well, that's correct and so on. So there was a guy named uh, Carlson, Carlson, who I met, you know, when I toured around the country, who who created a substance they call Sonic Bloom. And it, it comes from the, the sound of what he called it, the crickets. You know, when the crickets come out at night, they make a sound, a vibration, to the rest of the vegetation around them. And basically they they created these things. And so he created the sound and put it in the in the air. And we were growing uh, corn stalks were 18 feet tall, you know, and oh, wow. people yeah. So people were looking at it and they think, well, those people are strange over there. You know, we, we'd rather have those only the small ones, you know. And of course they were can't reach up the other Right. I mean, all these, you know, tomatoes, 100 or 500 tomatoes to one plant, all this stuff we experienced in 96. And all of a sudden, that guy was exiled from this country, you know, and basically, basically, you know, we thought we'd all be wealthy and rich and we could, you know, do all these wonderful things through vibration. And really, that's all we're doing is is showing this vibration, this love for the earth that responds to us, you know, as human beings. Mm-hmm. And so it taught me more about how, how important the Native Americans were, you know, that their ancestors were so into the earth, so much greater than, you know, the Europeans and so on. And that's why this United States is important to the rest of the world. But can we learn this? Can we actually learn how important that, you know, our ancestors really are and why we left those situations of control? We, we don't know yet. You know, we're, we're on the verge of finding. And I think that is what's going on with, with this new uh, this new age of Dwapara Yuga is teaching us that, you know, we we can be one. We we are one. We already are. We're not here to control anybody. We're here to ad- admire each other. And that's a hard thing to do. Russell, thank you so incredibly much for our beautiful conversation today. If um, I I would like to extend an invitation to you to return, um, to continue this conversation, to make it a, um, to make it as many parts as we wish it to be, to reach as many people as we can. Um, And I would also like to invite you to let people know where they can learn more 
more about the consciousness of water, more about <laughs> the divinity of it all, more about your work and how they can support it. Well, you know, it's very interesting that you said that because I do want to, I do want to say that I sort of quit doing the, you know, the, 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 um, the website, you know, I still have the website and, you know, if you want to go back to 10, 15, 20 years, you, we can do that, you know, but it's, it's clearwatervision.org. It's really simple and you'll find my telephone number, my address in there, but also you'll see that we we have been working together with it and there are people who are now donating you know in there and so i'm really impressed with it you know, only in the last few years and especially because people are now learning about brown gas and how important it is to, you know which is primary water we're all learning that you know and but if we want to support you know the thing that's going on you know, uh, more or less, you know, two or more gathered are so much more important because I can put a lot of work people to work in the, in the way that we had been in this information comes about this change, especially here in California, because we could feed the world with, with the central Valley, the way it is, if we could just bring water back and we can, you know, and so, um, we're interested in in actually doing revising the whole of California so that it can help other people in the rest of the world. That's it. And so, if you believe in that, just give me a call. You know, it's it's all on clearwatervision.org. And if you want want to change things, you know, uh, I'm open to anything that can go in in those terms to Clearwater Vision. So we're mainly involved with, with the, you know, getting the natives back into shape so that we can understand the importance of them. And uh, I mean, that's just really it, you know. Um, there are things that, uh, um, that uh, Annie O, which is, I'm so happy that you're connected to her, you know, because they too, address you know what we're doing is really important um doing the next steps are you know really important because um we want to shift from drilling wells you know which we've done in the past and to actually doing the moses thing to priming the pump in certain areas of the world so that we can show that it is possible to bring primary water up from the ground and of course, you know, especially uh, these 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 volcanoes that you know are the next step to revise them to bring those springs back, and uh, and help the vegetation of this country, this world. Um, and you, you can imagine what will happen to places like Africa, you know, and and you know, bring food back to people. I mean. It's okay to go, you know, doing these things and creating these wonderful things, you know, of getting water to people. And but if there's scarcity of water and if the water is polluted, it's it's dead. You know, you don't want to kill it. You want to revise it. So we're we have ways that we can do it using vortex technologies. I haven't put that in the website yet, but I'm sure that if people listen to this, they they know that what we're speaking is true. Inspired Tribe, I would like to encourage you simply to follow and trust what you're feeling. There's always something that comes up when you listen to something, come to new information, are exposed to new wisdom. So if you feel inspired to get in touch, to apply yourself, to bring what you have to give to this, please do reach out. I'm also talking to those who are for example, financially very abundant, millionaires, billionaires. If you feel that spark, if this gives you that spark of inspiration, please reach out to Russell. Uh, all, all kinds of help, um, all kinds of support is needed here. And, and uh, coming together for these visions, creating together around these visions. So uh, please don't be shy. We always encourage everyone to really get, you know, the, the, the second step after receiving inspiration is to take inspired action. That, that's, that's what we believe in. 
So, uh, Russell, once again, thank you so much, Russell Anderson, for joining us today. Again, uh, this is an open invitation. We would absolutely love and be honored to have you back. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, all the people that I know that are beginning to bring all this together, I, I'm so grateful for them, you know, that they connected me to you. And, uh, you know, I, th I thought there wasn't any hope for a while, you know, that now I'm believing again. And I'll do my best to reach out. Love you. Same here. Much love to you. Many, many blessings. To all of you as well out there watching and listening, please share this conversation. Please send this to someone who you feel might be inspired by this. And please don't be shy to reach out. Thank you so much, everybody. We love you. We appreciate you. And we'll be back with you very, very soon. God bless. Bye-bye.